Well, let me just say good morning to everyone. I'm really glad to be here this morning. This uh, is a beautiful building you have here. We can remember years ago when it used to be a restaurant, and uh, we would drive by, and we, we often thought, well, we should try that place out. But for some reason, we just never uh, never got around to it. But it seems to me that now this is probably a much better use of facility. The, it's a gathering place for the people of God. Now, the lesson this morning is coming out of Exodus chapter 16. Uh, so you've been studying this in your class, and that's great. That means it's fresh in our minds, and we're all thinking about it. So let's turn to chapter 16 of Exodus, and I will read the first 12 verses. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may prove them, that is, test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your murmurings against the Lord. For what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your murmurings which you murmur against him, what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your murmurings. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the murmurings of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Six weeks ago, December 16th, 2018, all eyes were on the sky. 2018's brightest comet came closest to the earth on that day. Six weeks ago, the Cowboys lost to the Colts 23 to nothing. Six weeks ago, Miss Universe's first transgender contestant rocked the runway. Six weeks ago, it was revealed that in the U.S., the most popular baby name for a boy was Noah. And for a girl, Olivia. If you were born six weeks ago, you unwittingly became a member of Generation Alpha. Over the last six weeks, same-sex marriage became legal in Australia. Over the last six weeks, China's Chang-4 spacecraft landed on the dark side of the moon. Over the last six weeks, the longest U.S. government shutdown in history began. 
over the last six weeks, the most expensive home in America, a 24,000 square foot penthouse that overlooks Central Park in New York, sold for $238 million. It was purchased by hedge fund founder Ken Griffin. So where were you six weeks ago? What were you doing six weeks ago? Were you shopping for Christmas presents still? Probably. Did you go out to eat somewhere six weeks ago after church was over with? Were you planning a trip? What's been going on in your world over the last six weeks? What's been going on in the church? What has been going on in this church over the last six weeks? Just think about that. Six weeks isn't all that long. Not really. But a lot can happen in a short span of six weeks. When you look back over the last six weeks, you might be thinking, well, my world isn't all that significant. It's not very big at all, really. I haven't accomplished that much. It's been pretty mundane and uneventful. Just flew right on by without even making a sound at all. But on the other hand, the last six weeks have been packed with significant events and no small amount of change all around us. The time that passed from the crossing of the Red Sea to the day that God sent bread from heaven, six weeks. It was on the 15th day of the second month. Six short weeks. Now, on the day that the Hebrews left Egypt, there's no way they could have possibly known what was going to take place over the next six weeks. They should have had a pretty good idea. They prob probably could have guessed something spectacular, especially when you consider the unbelievable events that they had been eyewitnesses to. They had seen with their own eyes just before their exodus out of Egypt. Pharaoh had increased their burden, and so God had called Moses to go back and lead the people out of Egypt. And he does. And they witness terrifying supernatural events. They watch as God had Moses turn his staff into a snake. Well, the Pharaoh's magicians turned their staffs into snakes. No big deal, right? Well, Moses' staff that turned into a snake ate all theirs. So, not quite the same thing. He turned the Nile River into blood. He sent a plague of frogs, then gnats, then swarms of flies. He killed Egyptian livestock, except for the Israelites. Theirs was okay. Moses threw ash dust into the air and brought miserable suffering boils and sores on the Egyptians. He brought down hail and fire, a plague of locusts, and for three days a frightening darkness covered the land. But the Israelites had light. And they witnessed the killing of the firstborn in every house and of all the livestock. They saw all of these things, they saw these things bring a reluctant and highly resistant Pharaoh to finally let them go. And they witnessed a pillar of cloud and of fire that led them by day and night. They saw the waters of the Red Sea split apart so that they walked out of Egypt across the seabed, the floor of the ocean, on dry land. And they watched as the waters of that sea crashed down onto the armies of Pharaoh and decimated. Over the next six weeks, they entered into a pattern of murmuring and complaining. They seemed to have a very short memory. They personally, just think about that, personally 
witnessed the mighty acts of God. These are the things that we refer to when we study and we think about the big things God has done in history. In salvation history, one of the most significant things to look back for is the fact that God brought his people out of bondage and eventually into the promised land. And these mighty signs and wonders, these are the big things we point to. And they were eyewitnesses to this. And they failed. We have to be very careful when we read Scripture, how we read the Bible. Uh, It's often been said that when you read the Bible, it's a very dangerous book. You have to be careful how you do it. Because if you read it, and if you really get it, if you understand what it's telling you, what it's saying, that's going to make you, I mean, it will. It's going to make you feel very uncomfortable. And if you read the Bible and you never feel uncomfortable, you're probably not getting it. It's not, something's not getting through. For a lot of us, when we read Scripture, especially when it's reassuring, all right, when it's comforting to us, when it encourages us, it lifts us up, We tend to read it as if it were speaking to me, my message, because it's helping me to recover. It's helping me to gather strength. It's helping me to feel better about myself. God's let me know that I'm special and he cares for me. I'm getting that out of my life. Now, when we read the difficult parts, when it describes people who fall short in a sin, when you read about failure and we read about all the ugly in people that is found inside those pages, we tend to read it as if it's talking about somebody else. We decide that we can't identify with that. Look at those terrible people in Exodus 15. Look at them. They're awful. What's wrong with them? Can't they see that what God is doing is an unbelievable thing and they get to be participants of God's work in the world? And they can't even see how wrong they are and what they're doing. And we can really easily, if you think about it, we can just look around. Other churches, the culture around us, people we know who are kind of like that. We look around and we can easily find lots and lots of examples of present day examples of people who are just like the enemies of God. Just like them. It's there. Read the news. There are enemies of God who are very vocal, very organized, and very motivated and very loud. And we can find people just like the people of God in their utter failure. It's everywhere. When we read the Bible, we tend to read it as if it's addressing us as individuals, as if its greatest concern is my comfort, my problem, my needs, my salvation, But the story we're looking at here in Exodus, this is a story that concerns the entire people of God. All of them. 600,000 men. Doesn't include all the women and children. Lots and lots of people, as we discussed this morning, we may be talking millions, at least a million. That's a lot of people. Now, all this is really dangerous when we talk about how we look at the Bible. Very dangerous. You may recall in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul said that these things, that these people right here, these things that they did, these were designed. I mean, all this, their actions, their murmuring, and the consequences were designed to warn us. 
and instruct us so that we won't think that we are immune to their failure. You have to understand that the us and we that Paul's talking about, it's plural. He's not talking to individuals. He's talking to the church. The church. The people of God. Not a collective of of autonomous individuals that just kind of show up and we meet together once a week because we happen to share a common faith or experience. We have got to start seeing ourselves as we are the people of God. I, the individual, I belong to the people of God. And when we read the Bible, we need to put ourselves dead center in the crosshairs. Think about that. You don't ask, am I like this? You ask, how am I like this? Because I am also a human being as they were human beings. You and I are not above self-interest. We're not above failure. We're, we're not even not even the type of failure we see here. It's, it's not very far from us if you think about it. We need to learn to make it a habit that when we read Scripture, and we see people like this, that what you're going to do is you're going to say to yourself, but for the grace of God, that's us. Think about it. But for the grace of God, that's this church. That's how, that's how really important this is. We complain all the time. We complain a lot. The sermon is too long. It's not relevant. It's boring. Every lesson's about some doctrine or some brotherhood issue, something we don't even care about. I don't like what so-and-so is wearing. No one greeted me when I came in. I just came in and sat down and like I'm not even here. I was sick last week and nobody called. Potluck Sunday. I forgot to bring something. All the people at church ever talk about is Jesus this and Jesus that. We complain about the weather. Has anybody ever done that? Oh, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's raining. When it's summertime, we say, well, man, I can't wait till it's winter to get some relief. Wintertime hits, man, it's so cold. I can't wait till summer gets here. Soldiers are great at complaining. That's been my experience. The basic rule of thumb, which is a myth, by the way, is that, well, you find a bunch of soldiers, if they're not complaining, there's something wrong. If they're complaining, that means they're happy. I I don't have how many times I've heard that. Well, it's not really true. But what is true is they complain. They complain a lot. If it's raining during a field training exercise, Someone, probably a lot of someones, is is eventually going to say, if it ain't raining, we ain't training. I remember in 2003, I deployed to Iraq. The daytime temperatures there were more than 120 degrees. It was hot. If you don't know, don't think that's hot. Try living in that environment when there's no air conditioning, there are no trees, no shade. The only relief you have is inside a GP large, a big tent, which takes the direct sun off of you, but it's an oven. It's just as hot on the inside, and the air is still. It's terrible. You find a little bit of a relief when you get it outside and find some shade when the sun goes down a little bit, but it's hot. And for the first three weeks, we had nothing but misery. And it took about three weeks before we got to have our first shower and and change clothes. We were in the same uniform. Socks, underwear, everything for three weeks. And everyone, everybody is, is like a, the walking dead. Just dragging around, walking around. And everybody at first is, oh, it's so hot. It's so hot. That's all you ever heard from anybody ever. And then after a while, they stop saying it. 
you just looked at each other and you just kind of nodded. And like, like you were acknowledging this, uh, yeah, it's hot. Because you were still complaining, you just were doing it with your eyes instead of your mouth. Well, it was terrible. And food. Do soldiers ever complain about the chow? Uh, I was in uh, long enough ago, what day when it was, long enough ago that I remember sea rations. Anybody here ever served in the military and remember eating sea rations? Oh, yeah, sea rations. And some are pretty good. Some are just downright disgusting. But that's all you had. And so we complained about it. Eventually, their army came up with tea rations. They were pretty good, actually. Uh, they'd make them in the... The MKT was the mobile kitchen trailer. It was a kitchen on wheels. And they would take these, uh, they called tea rats. And they were containers that were good size aluminum containers with aluminum foil on the top. And they were hermetically sealed so that you didn't have to refrigerate them or anything. You just kept them in the shelf. And when it came time to eat, the cooks would heat them up, peel back the stuff, and you had lasagna, enchiladas. Maybe you had a Salisbury steak, something really good. And it was pretty good, too. It was almost restaurant-quality stuff. We still complained about it. Now the Army uses MREs, half for a long time, meals ready to eat. And there's a huge variety of different kinds of MREs. Some are really good. My favorite was uh, shrimp jambalaya. That was good stuff. It was almost as good as a restaurant. It was really delicious to me. If you get past the smell and eat that, you're, you, you got a meal. And you'd find a group of soldiers sitting around eating their MREs. And they would talk about which one was their favorite. But that conversation very quickly pivoted to which ones were the worst. Which ones were disgusting. And they would start complaining about, I wish we just had a regular meal. Well, the regular meal meant the dining facility, the DFAT. And it was a little better than T-Rats. And it ranged anywhere from as, as good as that all the way up to almost home-cooked meal level food. Sometimes it was pretty good. But you know what? They complained. They still complained. Well, the Israelites set the standard for complaining. They complained about everything. In the face of God's great providence and care, they found reasons to complain. They were tired. They were thirsty. They were hungry. God led them out of bondage. He fed them. He gave them clothes that never wore out. He gave them water. He took bitter water and he made it sweet. There was nothing God didn't do for them to, to meet all of their physical needs. And they complained. God was testing them, testing them to see if they had what it takes to get over themselves, to rise above self-interest, to be able to follow simple instructions, to know what it means to surrender to Yahweh, to submit themselves to his leading, his providence, and fulfill their purpose on the earth. But instead, they put God to the test as if he hadn't done enough already. God gave them manna. Bread from heaven, God gave them manna. In John chapter 6, the Gospel of John chapter 6, there were some people, hungry people. People from the group had, of 5,000 that had just been fed by Jesus who were following him and coming to him, hoping he would do another miracle and feed them. And he saw their motives, and he knew they were really only interested in getting another free lunch. Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. He told them not to work for food that perishes. Not to focus on the appetite the physical appetite. He told them to work for food that endures for eternal life. They asked for a sign, and they looked back to this story 
and they pointed out their fathers ate from the bread from heaven, manna in the wilderness. And Jesus said to them, he said, I am the bread of life. That manna they ate in the wilderness, I am that bread. I am the manna from heaven. I am the bread of life. Think of how profound that is. The bread of life isn't bread. It's a person. It's a human. It's God in the flesh. It's God. It's a man. It's a person. The manna that fell from heaven represented something profound that we need to grasp. This is not just a story about if you complain, you'll get slapped down. That's not what the story's about. That's not it at all. It was more than just food for a day. Much more. We don't, we don't simply struggle with our physical appetite. We don't struggle for her appetite for food or for things or appetite for acceptance and validation. We also have a spiritual appetite. We all, all of us, have a deep, gnawing, gripping hunger for God. There's a song that says everybody's hungry for something. Guess what? It's for God. Self-interest leads us to feed on spiritual junk food. It's self-interest. That's what we have to fight. But nothing that we consume to fill that hunger, none of it hits the spot. None of it. Nothing satisfies. It doesn't really fill us up. And we complain. It all comes down to motive. All of it. Self-interest led Adam and Eve to eat what was forbidden. Self-interest led the people of God to complain as if they were entitled to more. If only we could go back to Egypt where we had it good. They didn't have that good. Very short memory. Self-interest led the crowd to follow Jesus looking for another meal to satisfy their physical hunger. And when you think about it, we're all foodies, all of us. We all have an appetite. We're always hungry, and we're always trying to feed it, fill it up. Think about that. Why are you here this morning? Why did you bother to get up and come to church? Isn't it because you're hungry? Did you not come here because you were hungry? We don't normally think of it like that. That's what we do. We hope that we're going to receive a blessing. We hope that we're going to be encouraged. Someone's going to notice my pain and say a word or two that's going to help me feel better. I'm going to get a prayer. I'm going to get something. I come here to get something out. I want to be fed, to be ministered to, because I have needs, and they feel really bad, and I want to feel good. We don't take time to realize that God is still leading his people. Grasp that. God is still leading the church through a wilderness. That's what this world is. It's a hostile world that still wants to enslave us. It's a world that feels absolutely threatened by your presence. The fact that you even exist and dare to claim a faith in God. That's a threat. You have no idea how threatening that is. And it's going to do anything it can to destroy it. Didn't Jesus say, if the world hates you, keep in mind, hated me first. And didn't he say, in this world, you have trouble. 
But take heart. I have overcome the world. And God is still providing what we really need. Not just what we think we need. So, I know you're already thinking, well, is it wrong? Is it wrong that I want to be fed? Is it wrong that I have this need for these things? Nope, that's not what I'm saying. It's not a matter of being wrong or right. Here's what it is. Being a Christian is not simply doing Christian things. That's not what it's about. It's more than believing certain truths and obeying in prescribed ways. It's not about doctrinal purity. It's not about conformity. It's not about how you look to others. It's none of those things. It's about the person, Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. A person. We just tend to think of all this in the abstract and realize it's really God who became one of us, who walked among the people of God. You are the people of God. That's what you have to get a hold of and understand. We are the people of God. He is the bread of life. He is the manna from heaven. He is the only food that satisfies your deepest hunger. And it does it in a way that you'll never be hungry again. You eat the food, this kind of food, what Jesus is talking about himself. You eat that, and six weeks from now, you're still going to be full. In fact, you're going to be satisfied all the way to forever. It's the only food that can give you the energy you need and the courage you need and the wherewithal to pick up your cross every day and follow Him. To put aside self-interest and follow God. That's where the power comes from. To be not individuals in isolation of each other that just happen to meet together in the same room for a period of time. But we together are the people of God. His church. So the question comes up. The question is not, it's not, didn't these people see what was going on? Didn't the Israelites know the manna had deeper uh, spiritual significance? Couldn't the people of God see that it was pointing to Christ? Well, they couldn't, but that's not the question. The question is, do you know? Do you see? What are you going to do about it? Are your eyes on the sky? Are you being fed? I never want to be responsible responsible for being the guy who causes people to have grief. Never have that intention. But this morning, I sincerely hope that you feel very uncomfortable. If you've been feeding on spiritual junk food, all can say to the church, come to Jesus and feast where the real food is. He is the bread of life, a manna from heaven. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, this is your opportunity to become one. To eat that meal, Jesus. I have all your sins forgiven. Be added to people of God to the church and you begin the same journey through the wilderness of this world all the way to eternity. If you are a Christian and you're here this morning and you need prayers for any reason, uh, prayers of encouragement, whatever your, whatever your need may be, I hope that you'll take that to heart and ask that you come forward now while we stand aside.